note, Singapore is becoming greener and greener by the minute. We've got our million tree planting uh, movement that's been going on already. Uh, I think it's probably getting close to 100,000 trees have been planted more, already. More. Is it more than that? And the great Sir David Attenborough himself has said that Singapore can be a city template for the rest of the world in the way that we integrate urban density with biodiversity. David Attenborough himself, the endorsements do not get any bigger. Yeah, let's check in with uh, with uh, our Minister of National Development to see what the government perspective is on the greening of Singapore. Desmond Lee, Minister for National Development and Minister in Charge of Social Services Integration, a champion of the Green Singapore. Good morning, welcome to Weekend Mornings. Very good morning, uh, Neil and, and Glenn. Very glad to be here. We Thank are so happy to... Well, thank you for, for coming on and spending some time on your Saturday morning. Uh, talk to us about where we're at right now with Singapore's city in nature and the environmental success we've had. We've seen a lot more people getting out and enjoying nature, especially over the past year uh, during uh, COVID. Uh, from your perspective, how are we doing? Well, we've almost hit 200,000 trees in our One Million Trees movement and more to, more to go. Uh, you know, we started off as a garden city in the mm. early days. And then a city in a garden, uh, reflecting the uh, the growth in our in our green areas, and now city in nature is this big push as part of the Singapore Green Plan uh, to intensify greenery, uh, to uh, push uh, the con conservation of biodiversity, and to uh, mainstream uh, public consciousness uh, about the importance of of greenery, about biodiversity, about our blue spaces, and to mm -hmm. Uh, encourage every Singaporean, everyone here on this island to be a steward of nature. Uh, Minister, you were at the opening of the recent uh, rail corridor. Glenn and I have both been there. I think it's a spectacular success. I really do. I think it's terrific. Is the rail corridor in some ways a template because it's it really manages well that delicate balance. I mean, it literally runs between urban density on either side. So is that the kind of delicate balance that we're we're looking to strive for in Singapore? Well, in a way, the rail corridor uh, is, a, is a microcosm of the broader yeah. challenges that we face and the kind of approach that we have to take, the kind of discipline, the kind of uh, uh, conversations, the kind of trade-offs we have to make. And you know, the uh, return of the rail corridor took a long time. Uh, it's, uh, it runs all the way and, 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 and dissects uh, our, our, our island from north to south. And so for the 24 kilometers of land, uh, we decided to strike a three-way balance. On the one hand, the rail corridor, uh, all the way from Woodlands to Tanjung Paga, we made a, a, a decision to keep it for community, for recreation, and for nature. Uh, you know, it was the, the, the rail track, and uh, over the last 10 years, it's been more green. Uh, we have to put in more uh, native biodiversity and, and native species, but it will green it up, uh, make it suitable for people of all ages, and also for sports and recreation. Uh, but then along the rail corridor, there are some uh, sites that serve as a reminder of our history, serve as a reminder of uh, the importance of the rail in the early days uh, for industry, for transportation of people, of food and goods. And so we decided to conserve those from a heritage point of view. And finally, uh, there are parcels of land along the rail corridor that were used in the past for for residences, for storage of equipment, of, of carriages, turntables that we decided to use uh, to meet our needs for development like housing, mm -hmm. industry, commerce, and so on. So we strike the three-way balance. We're speaking with Desmond Lee, Minister for National Development and Minister in Charge of Social Services Integration. Of course, the West Coast GRC is uh, where he calls home. Over this past year, uh, Mr. Lee, we have seen uh, so many more people get out and about during the circuit breaker and since the circuit breaker. Uh, I was living in the East Coast at the time. East Coast Park was never busier. The park connectors have never been busier. And uh, Neil and I have both seen on the rail corridor that mm. it gets quite busy as well. Has has this surprised you, the, the just the number of people that are out and about now in nature? And will government need to, uh, to further um, add more places and, and think about the density of our, of our public's uh, parks and spaces? Well, you asked me whether I'm surprised. The answer is yes and no. Yes, in the, <laughs> in the sense that, uh, you know, we know that people aren't able to travel and they need to uh, find spaces to, to, to rest, to relax, to spend time with family. 
uh, surprised in the sense that, well, sometimes you think people will go to the malls, to, to the cinemas, yeah. and, you know, but uh, going out into the parks, into our green areas, even areas that are not parks, you know, uh, vegetated areas, just to explore the outdoors and nature. I think that's, that's surprising mm -hmm. in a good way, but not surprising in the sense that uh, you know, Singaporeans have the, the sense of consciousness about, about nature, about the environment, about the green space, that inquisitiveness uh, from an initial sense that Singapore is all city, to the to the recognition that actually in this density you have some very green spaces we have uh, biodiversity uh, on a scale that most people would not associate uh, with an urban setting i think that that uh, mainstreaming uh, is a long time coming and in a way this uh, uh, covid pandemic i mean it's a, it's a harsh pandemic it's caused a lot of distress and 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 difficulties for people all around the world including in singapore but it's a silver lining it has kind of uh, accelerated uh, that mm. uh, public awareness and mainstreaming. So in a way, uh, quietly uh, thankful uh, for this uh, silver lining. On that point, Minister, you recently said that our quest to become, you know, a city in nature is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, those were your words. What, what, what did you actually mean by that? Well, I said that uh, extemporary was uh, an event at the book launch uh, where some uh, uh, researchers studied the uh, impact of uh, greenery or a you know, rainforest walk uh, on your senses, on your well-being, on your mental health. And uh, reflecting on Professor Tommy Cole's uh, words, I decided to, to talk about uh, city in nature. And I, I said that it was both a, a blessing and a burden uh, mm. to be a city in nature, uh, simply because, uh, you know, uh, not just because of COVID, but because of uh, the changes in our demographic, the global challenges that we face, uh, our developmental pressures are greater than, than never before and will only grow greater with new uh, requirements foisted upon us by this crisis and others. Uh, and so developmental pressures uh, accelerating and accentuating, but in, not just in, in spite of that, but because of that, we made a concerted decision uh, to push for a city nation to elevate uh, this as part of national development on an equal footing as other needs like, like housing, like healthcare, uh, like recreation and others. And it's a, it's a burden uh, to push for a city in nature because, you know, unlike uh, larger countries which have that, uh, that, that, that strategic depth, you know, and, 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 and of land to be able to expand mm -hmm. uh, and encroach on, on nature, uh, they, they don't feel it. Right, but for us, from day one, our 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 tensions, our stressors have been felt through generations of planners and through generations of governments, uh, and so a burden to continue to push for greenery within our city, for biodiversity, for connectivity, guided by science and good planning. But uh, the tensions from uh, sociological change, demographic change, uh, need for more housing, the blessing of uh, of longevity the blessing of uh, diversity of aspirations among Singaporeans that translate into a more land use pressures, more need for space to do things, more need for space for themselves and their families, the nuclearization of families, uh, the increase in number of singles who aspire to housing, uh, the, the needs for healthcare and, and, and support for our seniors. All these are pressures that add to our burden as we seek to push forward uh, in the face of developmental pressures to be a city in nature. But a blessing because, uh, you know, no, as you said, uh, Neil, there's, there's no other city and sovereign city-state that uh, is as green as we are. Correct. Because from day one, that was the DNA set in place. And we've, we're blessed, therefore, by decisions of earlier generations that enable us to, to, uh, to benefit from cleaner air, uh, from, uh, uh, from a mitigation of the urban heat island effect, from uh, bio bioremediation of water that goes into our, our nature ways and waterways, from the uh, overall livability uh, of having nature all around us that uh, no artificial edifice can, can, mm. can replace. Yeah, so much, so much to consider uh, in that statement as we talk about how Singapore further develops. Uh, as we're speaking to Desmond Lee, Minister for National Development and Minister in Charge of Social Services Integration. Th this past week, uh, I, uh, several days, I, I did uh, morning walks up to Fort Canning Hill, and there are lots of historic photos up there, of course, uh, showing the area in at the turn of the century, in you know, 1900s, early 1900s, and just how deforested 
you know, for as far as the eye could see, there were there was not one tree in many areas of Singapore back in the early 1900s uh, and mid 1900s. So the country has come a long way since then. Yeah, and the British did that. And so, the, <laughs> thanks to the British, the Brits did yeah. that. They destroyed Bukit Larangan, <laughs> the well, Fort Kenny. Many, yeah, many places were were really that. But now we've seen it really turn around to the point where. Uh, you know, we have all seen the stories about the otters, you know, jumping into the condo swimming pool this past week. The video that was there was uh, was really quite amazing. Uh, the uh, the wild boar encounters that people have had. Now it's kind of turning the other way where we're really fighting this this pressure between uh, nature coming back and wanting to come back and people. How, how do we how do we overcome those challenges or how do we work with those challenges, uh, Minister Lee? Indeed, uh, with uh, city nature, uh, with more green spaces that we want to protect and intensify, uh, with more arteries of greenery uh, running through our streetscape and in our estates, uh, with people wanting to uh, plant more microforests, uh, with uh, science-based kind of uh, planting, uh, and even with uh, vertical greenery, you know, nature will, will find its way and nature will nestle in, even on greenery on a building. Uh, there will be more uh, interaction between uh, people and nature. I mean, cities are artificial uh, uh, you know, uh, urban settings carved out of the natural environment. Uh, but as you bring nature back in, as you let it uh, weave its way through our city, you will encounter more uh, wildlife. Right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, not just in Singapore, but even, even cities around the world, in, in North America, for instance, you see all these uh, reports of, of uh, mammals getting right into the heart of the city and people don't yeah. know how to react. Uh, we, will, we, we, we are facing that and we will face more of that. And in a way, it's a, it's a blessing because, you know, the city is just so much more marvelous uh, with mm -hmm. native biodiversity right in the heart of it. But uh, our behavior, our interaction can uh, can can make that uh, not quite a pleasant encounter. So if you feed uh, mammals, then they, they will get uh, habitualized and then mm. they may cause the problems down the line. And so we have a whole series of strategies that we have to implement. One would be public education, uh, mm. including public education of our young uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, we have to put in place laws to, uh, to make clear to people that certain uh, acts are inappropriate. For example, mm. feeding of wildlife. Uh, we have to put in place infrastructural, uh, appropriate infrastructural uh, mechanics, you know, for example, hoardings in certain areas to uh, just to protect certain residential areas. We can put in technology like, uh, you know, tamper proof bins uh, or certain kinds of window grills for people who are living close to nature. They want to enjoy mm -hmm. it. Uh, they want to be close to it. They know how to react to it. But sometimes you just need to make sure that the, me the, the measures are in place to ensure public safety. Otherwise, you'll get a very big pushback. Uh, I'm getting lots of uh, emails and messages telling us to take uh, firmer action against authors. Uh, that will mm. create uh, tension within mm. the community. Uh, but we'll have to deal with that. That's part of the maturing mainstreaming process. Uh, there's a need to ensure public safety. But we do that through both public measures, but also public education uh, and through the introduction of appropriate legislation. Yeah, Minister, that balance is fascinating. We have a young mm. producer on this show who could almost be a microcosm for, for the next generation because he's a young Singaporean and he loves nature and he loves greenery. But he also says, I want a BTO flat. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got to manage that balance. That That is a response I hear almost every day. I'm sure you do yeah. in, in Singapore. But on the positive side, because I do think there are many positives out of this, Minister, when you look at the, the public responses to news surrounding Dover Forest, to Clementi Forest, to recent events at Kranji, the unfortunate clearing of secondary forest. I, I see that as a positive, don't you, Minister? But maybe 20, 30 years ago, I think there might have been a slightly hekela attitude. But now, today, there is a keen interest in Singapore's green spaces. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I agree with you. I, I tell my colleagues, please don't see this as a negative, of course. Mm. Uh, there are things that could have, could have been done better. We'll have to examine what happened. Uh, there are, there's need, of course, to uh, mainstream uh, knowledge about the trade-offs that we face. We need to mainstream an understanding, a basic understanding of the scientific assessments of the different habitats and green spaces so that we can make 
the appropriate decisions as to what areas we need to use for housing, uh, what areas we need to rejuvenate in order to make sure that we, we conserve green spaces and rejuvenate brown brownfield sites and existing uh, ur urban spaces. And what do we really need to keep because they're core, core habitats or important connectors uh, for nature uh, to thrive uh, in this very dense uh, and very small city. So I, I see this as a positive. It's helped to peak public consciousness. But yeah. I've had conversations with groups of people, young people, people who are young at heart, and there's still some way to go. Uh, because mm. uh, some of these incidents uh, cause people to understand more deeply the kinds of trade-offs and tensions between the need for urban development and the need to ensure that in an urban scape, you have lots of green spaces, green lungs, an emerald uh, heart in the middle of the city. Uh, and, and, but there are still people who, who, who have a particular view uh, about needs. But you, yeah. know, you see the tension, you're, you're right, you have a producer who, who, who enjoys nature but also wants his housing. I've, I've spoken to environmentalists who are very passionate about conservation of green spaces but who in the same breath tell me that they have been waiting and waiting for their home, uh, a chance to get a home. So, yeah. so those pressures uh, are inevitable and in a way cause people to, to explore and better understand the unique yeah. challenges that we face right here. Uh, on our 720 square kilometer island. Yeah. Well, that leads to the big philosophical question then. We've talked about it already. <clears throat> we love otters until they eat our expensive koi carp. We love birds as long as they're not noisy. We love greenery, but we don't want the snakes, the occasional snake that it may bring to our housing estate. It's such a fine line, isn't it? It's almost human nature, Minister, for us to have such a contradictory relationship with nature. So bearing all that in mind, is a city in nature actually possible? Absolutely possible. We are, we're on the, on the way. It's a journey. Uh, the, the actual progress, we're adding more than a million trees, more than a million over the next 10 years because we have to offset trees that are lost due to development like road widening or to disease. So we're going to get uh, uh, not just end parks to plant trees, but we want to use this opportunity to mainstream nature consciousness by getting many, many people on this island to plant trees. And over the last few months, I've met many Singaporeans, young and young at heart, who are planting trees for their very first time in their lives. Yeah. I said, use this as a chance to, to remember this family bonding experience and the trees will grow up, provide shelter, not for you, but for your grandchildren. It's an act of stewardship. It's values in action. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the physical manifestation, the, st the stewardship mindset that is evolving as people get involved and participate. And as these tensions arise, I think these are, are opportunities to have conversations around what we really want as a city in nature, what being a, a, a citizen or a resident in a, of a city in nature mean. And so mm. it's not just about more intensive greening. There's been... Uh, in place for decades and decades. We're, of course, going to intensify that. We're going to mainstream the science, scientific consciousness, the kind of technology that we're using so that people understand uh, what are the important areas that we need to protect. They understand the kinds of measures we put in place to enable this uh, biodiversity to thrive in our midst, amidst one of the densest cities in the world. But at the same time, the kind of uh, biophilic, you know, biophilial behavior that we, we need to inculcate uh, with each other and with with the rest of the flora and fauna around us so that we we, we, we shepherd, we protect and we steward this for the next generation. I think that's a very important mindset for a city that is uh, as improbable as ours with all the intensities and pressures. I think I think this this mindset uh, will, will, will have wider benefits and wider ramifications in times to come. And I totally agree with you, uh, Minister Lee. Neil has been tree planting with his family. I've been tree planting Several with times, my yeah. family. You know, we, we every time we go past the our tree, in quotes, in woodlands, you know, as a family, we all look at it if we're driving. Uh, it's because it's near the expressway. So, I mean, that that is a thing that really brings people together. Uh, the other challenge, I think we've talked a lot about nature encroaching on on man and on, on, on our 
uh, on our city life, but also, you know, so many more people are out in nature as well. We had, of course, uh, in recent years, the the personal electronic, uh, you know, motor, motorized device uh, issue of people using those paths. We've had challenges with people on bicycles, uh, you know, not using the pathway, mm. paths the right way, uh, runners, everything else. So they're, they're really, it's not just nature that's that's taking good use, good advantage of these spaces, but we are too. And, and we have to learn as I think, citizens of Singapore, how to use those spaces properly as well. How do we address those those kinds of issues? No, we are, we are so happy that people are out and about exploring uh, the great outdoors and our green spaces. There, there are uh, uh, nature parks, there are trails, there are park connectors, there's so much out there to explore. Uh, but as we go into these spaces, as well as other spaces not intended for recreation and, and, and the outdoor adventure, uh, uh, please right. Uh, bear in mind the following. Number one, you are in a natural environment. These are precious areas. Try not to go, or in fact, you should not go off trail. Uh, you do not know what you're trampling. It could be a rare uh, a flora, all right? That could, you have disturbance to the habitats, to the, uh, the, to the cycle of, 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 of life. Uh, or a spitting cobra careful, <laughs> or something. Be, be, be careful because some of these places, uh, you know, these are natural environments. They're not, yeah, uh, yeah. the cheese are not checked. So take care of your own safety. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that there's more than enough uh, green spaces for us to explore uh, whilst enabling people to, to explore Singapore safely. Wonderful. A quick personal question, final question from me, Minister Lee. As I mentioned at the top of the interview, I first saw you at a Pulau Ubin Day. You know the Ubin Day they have a couple of years ago. And I noticed you broke away from the main group just to examine this snake. Uh, I'll say it was a paradise tree snake. I can't remember. But you were fascinated by this snake. And it, it was it was clearly from a place of sincerity. You do genuinely have an interest and a passion for biodiversity and nature generally. I'm just curious, where did that come from? Well, if you think about it, uh, growing up in a, in a city, like every other young person, I would have thought that this was just a city and that uh, nature and biodiversity you explore overseas. But uh, when I was very young, uh, school holidays would stay in a chalet in, in Changi. And uh, there's an intertidal area. I'm not sure if you're aware. When the tide goes down, you go out there, the rocky shores, the intertidal uh, habitats, the pools. Year on year, it's a changing uh, a, a landscape. Uh, and just marveling together with my sister and my, and my cousins, just exploring those habitats. Uh, kind of um, just, you know, this is, this is the twinkle in the eye when you see that in this city, there's such, there's such wonderful wildlife. And uh, of course, when I was young, I, I, I grew plants, I, I, I collect orchids. It's a more than 30 years of uh, orchid growing. Uh, but in when I was in university, uh, if you recall, there was a Chik Jawa issue. Of course. In the early 2000s, and I was still in, in university. And uh, and my friends and I decided we should go and take a look at the place uh, and, and to contribute our, our own voice uh, to, to the issue. Uh, and we went to buy boots, we walked around, and we visited it twice. And the second time, we saw how advocacy uh, made uh, people sit up and, and, and listen and to contemplate. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's flip side, the, the damage that was caused by having hundreds and hundreds of people trample mm -hmm. through uh, seagrass meadows, through rocky pools, rocky shores, uh, through, through, the, uh, through the open uh, uh, habitat. And, and that kind of uh, reinforced uh, my own personal uh, beliefs that you know, to, to protect the environment in Singapore, uh, that that's an extra heavy responsibility for all of us. Uh, indeed, I think I think we all agree. We talk about the environment so much uh, on this show, particularly, but we do appreciate uh, having you come on and, and give us your views. Uh, Desmond Lee, Minister for National Development, Minister in Charge of Social Services, and and I understand you you do have a birthday coming up in July, so I think. Uh, Neil and I would like to wish you from yeah, I'm not going morning. to sing. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> the first we want to be the first ones to wish you a happy birthday, even though it's a few months away. <laughs> but it's hard Thank to believe very that. Very kind of you. At, at, yeah. at 45 years young, uh, the the impact you're making already on uh, on Singapore's landscape, political and environmental. So thank you for your service to that. No, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, all the people who, who who care so much about the environment, including all my colleagues in NPARCs, both past and present and future. Uh, we, this is not uh, my effort. It's not the effort of the government. It's a community effort. Mm -hmm. We are maturing. 
and everyone's playing a part, you know, including including Neil. And you know, I was reading to my daughter about the Raffles bag of lemons uh, last <laughs> night, and, and I told her actually it's Raffles Bandit Langer. Uh, yes, so, uh, you're reading my new book, Minister. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Every, everyone uh, everyone uh, contributes, and I think even for for young Singaporeans, you should start there. Yeah, start there, start young, and it's. Part I just of your got. I've just got a ministerial endorsement for my book, so I think we'll stop there. <laughs> uh, Minister Desmond Lee, thank you again for being with us on Weekend Mornings. We appreciate your time today and hope you'll come back. Thank you. Take care.